Hey, we are in week two of a series that we started last week entitled God is, God is. And, and what we're doing at throughout this series is we're looking at the various names, the various attributes and the characteristics of God, who God really is in our life. Because when we get to know God by his name, it opens the door to knowing his character more fully and experiencing his power more deeply. That when we get to know the characteristics of God, we get to experience his power. We get to experience who Christ really is. And as believers and followers of Jesus Christ, it's extremely important that we know who God is, the characteristics of this God that we serve. And so in the Bible, names held great significance. It revealed important information about the individual and who this person was. And so that's why throughout scripture, you'll see time and time again that that God will come to individuals at time and he says, I'm going to change your name. Like for us, we're like, why would he change his name? He would come to individuals like Esau and he says, you're no longer going to be Esau, but you're going to be Jacob because you're not going to be remembered by your past. You're going to be remembered by the future that I have for you. He would look at at Peter or Simon, which was his name, a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. And he'd say, hey, you're no longer going to be known just as Simon. You're going to be known as Peter because upon you, Peter, I am going to build my church. Because in this culture, in that day, in that age, names had extreme significance. And so we have to understand who this God is that we are serving. Now, I don't know about you, but as a father, when I was picking names for my kids, I didn't necessarily look up their names. Maybe some of you did, but here's what I did when I was looking at names for my children. I just wanted to make sure that they had a name that couldn't be made fun of, right? Anybody else do that? So like, I would take their name and I would think, okay, what if somebody was being really mean to them? How could they give them a nickname? What could they say about this name? And so I didn't necessarily think about the names and the significance of the name behind it. And so I was looking up this week, like the names in our family. So for me, my name is Aaron and and the the name of Aaron is Teacher or Mountain of Strength. And I'm like, hey, I like that name. I'm not sure anybody remembered to really name that, but that's what it means. I looked up Abby and her name is Father's Joy. Now you'd have to ask her father if she really brought her joy all of her life, okay? But that's her name. We looked at the name Landon and Landon's name is this, Long Hill or Ridge. It's like, man, where did, what, what does that mean? You know, like poor guy. Like there's no thought to it. Jackson got a name and his name means God is gracious. Like, I, I mean, he is gracious, but that's not why I named him Jackson. You see, in our culture, names don't seem to have as much significance as it did in the biblical stories, in the biblical narrative, but the name of God is so important. We do still understand that names have some significance because let's just be honest, you're not naming your children Hitler or Jezebel, right? And if you have, how mean can you be? Like you don't name them these names. Why? Because you know that that name has significance. It has, a, it has something that's going to bring something to someone's remembrance. You see, because of the depth of God's character, he couldn't just be called by one name. That the depth of God's character is so enormous, it's so great, that he has many names to reflect the many ways that he relates to humanity. And one of the things that I want you to understand today is this, is that God has a name for every situation we find ourselves in. That the character of God, the greatness of our God is so powerful that he has a name for every situation that we find ourselves going through in life. That he's going to show up in the middle of that situation. He's going to reveal himself to you in a very personal and intimate way because his character is so amazing. It's so incredible. And In Proverbs, Solomon would say it this way. In Proverbs 18, verse 10, he would say, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. That the the name of the Lord is a strong tower. That all of a sudden when we begin to understand the character, the nature, the names of God in our life. That the name of the Lord is that strong tower for your life. That no matter what you're going through, that his name will be the source of your strength. What does that mean for us? It means this, that, that the Lord, when we begin to understand that God is a God of love. That I can begin to find refuge in the love that God has for me. That the name of the 
Lord is a name of mercy. And so I can find refuge in the mercy that God has for me. That in the name of the Lord is strength. And so when I'm weak and tired, I can run to the Lord and I can find strength and refuge in him. That the name of the Lord is righteousness. So I find refuge in the righteousness of God. That in the name of the Lord is a strong, strong tower. Aren't you grateful for the name of the Lord this morning? If you are, would you give Jesus Christ an ovation of praise? That no matter what we go through in life, God has a name to see us through those situations. See, so many of our problems in life, so much of our pain, so much of our disappointment, so much of our hurt or our, our brokenness, so, much of, uh, so many times we find ourselves worn out or exhausted or, or fearful or alone. But I believe that so many of the problems that we face in life, the reason we go through those problems is that because we don't truly understand the true nature of the God that we serve. We don't truly understand that he is a good, holy, loving, merciful and compassionate God. And therefore, we have to know the names of this Lord that we serve, the name of the God in which we give our hearts and our lives to. So today, as we look towards the Bible, I want us to look at one of the characteristics of God. And I want us to take a look at a passage of scripture that's found in the Old Testament. And it's a passage of scripture that is spoken out of the mouth of Jeremiah. And it's found in the book of the Bible known as Lamentations. And so if you're not really familiar with the Bible, maybe this is a book of the Bible that you've not heard of very often. But it's the book of Lamentations. It's found in uh, chapter 3 of this book. And, and here's the context that Jeremiah is a prophet of God. And Jeremiah is going through a very difficult season of life. Like, like I don't know, maybe some of you in this room could relate to the same same season that Jeremiah was going through. Like here's where Jeremiah's at in his life. He is tired, he is worn out, he's alone, and he's disappointed with what's happening in life. Has anyone ever been there? Have you ever been tired or worn out, exhausted, frustrated, or disappointed where life has taken you? And in Lamentations 3, he is lamenting. That's why it's called Lamentations. He's lamenting to the Lord about all the things that are going on in his life and all the difficulties that he sees going on around him. And I encourage you to read the whole chapter, but let me kind of put it in common vernacular, words that you would understand. Here's what Jeremiah is saying in Lamentations 3. He's saying people are difficult. Anybody ever met any difficult people in your life? Hopefully you don't say that this morning about your wife who was in the car with you, okay? Like people are difficult. He's saying life isn't fair. He's going, my body is wrecked. I can't sleep. I'm broke. I'm overwhelmed with anxiety. And on top of that, Jeremiah's lamenting because he's like, and it doesn't even seem like God cares. Like this is the mindset of Jeremiah, and it may very well be the mindset of some of you who are sitting here today. But then in verse 19, he's going, I've thought about all of these things, and here's all the issues that are going on in my life. And in verse 19, he says this though. He says, then I remembered my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. Life is horrible. Life is overwhelming. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. He's like, I am so overwhelmed with life. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. And today I want to call to mind a beautiful name of God that will give you hope when you're hurting, that will give you hope when life isn't going well. It'll give you hope when things are just all out of order. And here is what he calls to mind. He says this, he goes on in verse 22 and says, he says, what I call to mind is this, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. And here's the characteristic of God that I want us to look at today. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. Aren't you glad that the mercy of God is new every single morning of your life? That this is who our God is. He is a God of mercy. And today I want to talk to you about Jehovah Hesed. It would simply mean 
means God of mercy. That one of the names of God is that he is a God that is full of mercy. And that no matter what's happening in our life, no matter how overwhelming life seems to be, that the mercies of God are new, the mercies of God are fresh every single morning and they are available to each and every one of us in this room today. Would you give Jesus Christ an ovation of praise? And so when we are hurting, it is God's mercy that will give us hope. Let me pray real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your presence, Lord, that's in this place, Lord, that your Holy Spirit goes before us. And God, I'm asking that God, that you would speak to us today. God, I pray that when life is overwhelming, God, when we're hurting and God, it seems like there's no hope. God, may we understand and God, may we have revealed to us today the mercy of God in a new and a fresh way, God. And may we understand that your mercies are new every morning. So God, great is your faithfulness to each and every one of us. In your name we pray, amen and amen. So I want to talk to you about the mercy of God. The mercy of God, that he is Jehovah Hesed. He is the God of mercy. You see, this subject about the mercy of God is more complex than most people would think. And the reason the mercy of God is so complex is because there are so many layers to the attributes. There's so many layers to the characteristics of who God is. And the challenge inside of a series like this, when we begin to talk about the names of God is the challenge is to understand that, that the attributes that, of God, that people see them, that when we see the attributes of God, people often will are like, well, all these attributes kind of overlapped, and it just seems like they're, they're all the exact same thing, and that his love and his grace and his mercy and his joy, and, and that he's just and he's faithful, that they're all kind of the same thing. And while these characteristics of God are all similar, and they are all true about who God is, they are also very unique, and they are also very distinct. And so as we talk about the mercy of God, I want, you to, I want us to look at three attributes of God that are closely related but very different in function. Because if we're going to understand Jehovah Hesed, if we're going to understand the God of mercy, we have to understand what it means that he is full of mercy and that his mercies are new every morning. And so we talk about the characteristics of God and we talk about mercy. We have to kind of define three characteristics that are similar but very distinct. The first is this, it's the, the justice of God. And justice is this, when, when you get what you deserve, when you get what you deserve, that culturally when someone does something horrible to someone else, we, we are very much in that moment where like, hey, when there's punishment for what they've done, it's like justice has been served. We, we love justice for people who have done wrong in life. But then there's also the grace of God. And the grace of God is this, when you get what you don't deserve. And for every single one of us in here today, we did not deserve salvation. We don't deserve salvation. The Bible tells us that we are saved by grace, that God gives us something that we don't deserve, that you and I do not deserve this love of God in our life. It's a free gift that's given to each and every one of us. But then there's the mercy of God. And the mercy of God is this, when you don't get what you do, deserve when you don't get what you do deserve and the truth is this is we love justice for everyone else but we want mercy for ourselves right like we love it when justice is performed for someone else around us but when it comes to our own life when it comes to our own failures our own shortcomings we want mercy we want mercy when that police officer pulls you over and you were going too fast right and all of a sudden, you're, he's coming up to your window and you know you were going 100 miles per hour in like a 70 mile per hour zone. Like you know that you were caught in that moment, but what you don't want in that moment is justice because justice is that you get the ticket. What you want in that moment and what you're praying for is that officer walks up to your car is like, Lord, please don't give me a ticket. Please let him be the kindest officer I've ever met in my life. You're thinking about all the names you can drop. You're thinking about if tears can start coming down your eyes. Like, like you're trying to work it. Why? Because in that moment, you deserve the ticket, but you want mercy when you don't get what you do deserve. 
And the good news for each and every one of us today is simply this, that God is a merciful God, that God is a God who looks down upon us and he says, guess what? In your life and in your situation and in the circumstances that you are going through, you may deserve something else, but guess what? I have mercy that abounds in every situation. My mercy is new every single morning. And when you wake up tomorrow, you're not gonna get what you do deserve, but you are gonna wake up to the mercy and to the blessings and to the covering of God in your life. That he is a God of mercy. He is a merciful God. Now there's a text of scripture found in Ephesians chapter 2. And it's written by the apostle Paul. And, and I'll just be honest, it's not like a fun passage of scripture at all. Because in this passage of scripture, Paul contrasts our spiritual condition without Christ. And then what happens when we actually have God's mercy in our life? It's found in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And here's what Paul writes. He says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin. Every single one of us used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying, obeying the devil. Then he would go on and say this in verse 3. All of us used to live like this. Every single one of us. No matter how righteous, no matter how good you think you've been, no matter if you think you're better than someone sitting next to you this morning, the Bible makes it clear. All of us used to live that way. Following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature, that our nature is sinful. And by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else what is Paul saying let me summarize it for you he says without Christ you are not physically dead but you are spiritually dead there is a void inside of your life and every single one of us were faced with this void because of our disobedience to God we would suffer a spiritual death and that when we live apart from God that we are obeying the devil that he is the one who controls. He is the one who would be ruling our life and we're following our sinful desires. And because of this, because we're obeying the devil, because we're following our sinful desires, guess what? We are subject to God's anger or we're subject to God's wrath. That this is what we deserve for our behaviors. This is what we deserve for the choices and the decisions that we've made in our life. That we are subject to God's anger, subject to God's wrath. Now, for some of us that are sitting in here, maybe that sounds a little confusing to you. You're like, Aaron, we talk about it all the time in church about how he is such a loving God, that that is part of the character and the nature of God. How is it that this loving God could also be a God who is angry? How can it be both? How can a loving God also be an angry God? Let me show you for a moment how love and anger can coexist in the same phrase and in the same characteristics of God. And let me do so by putting it into the context of your own life. How many of you have children in this room today? Any, any parents in the room, right? Like you love your children, don't you? Like, like they're, I mean, they're the world to you. You love them unconditionally. You love your child. But the moment that they come home and they lie to you, right? Doesn't that just bring some anger to the surface? Anyone ever been there? Like you love your child, but when they lie to you, you are angry in that moment and you feel love for them, but you also have anger at the same time. Why? It coexists together and it does not change your love for them, but anger is also present. For some of you, maybe you have a very close friend and you love this friend. But maybe this friend indulges in uh, alcohol way too much and they drink too much. And, and not only do they drink, but they drive drunk. And, and you love this person, but you are what? You're angry at them because of the decisions and choices they're making because it could be harmful to those people that are around them. That love and anger, what? It coexists in that moment. For some of you wives, you, you love your husband but he doesn't put the toilet seat down. And in that moment, love and anger coexist, right? You're like, why can't he just get it together? You see, the same is true about God. When God is angry, 
it's not just anger that he feels in that moment, that when he is angry, when we are subject to God's anger, he can both love people and be angry at that which hurts his creation. And so Paul is saying, without Christ, we're dead in our sins. We're subject to his anger. But then in verse 4 of Ephesians, we have some incredible words and, and words that are so powerful. Maybe the two of the best words in the Bible. And it's simply this. It says, but God. Say that with me. Say, but God. We're dead in our sins. We're obeying the devil. We, we are giving away to our sinful nature. But God is so rich in mercy. He's so rich in hesed. And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. That even though there's anger associated with the actions and choices of our life, that God is rich in his mercy. That even though we deserve to be punished, but because of God's rich mercy, he does doesn't give us what we deserve. And that is what transforms everything. The fact that God doesn't give us what we deserve. These words, rich in mercy, are so powerful. Because what it does is this, is there's powerful words because what it means is this, is that God lives in a continual, ongoing state of unending mercy for each and every one of us. That he's rich in mercy. What does that mean? That he's got so much mercy, he's not going bankrupt. That nothing is going to deplete the mercy of God in our life. That nothing is going to make God go broke in mercy. That he lives in a continual state of mercy. And that he gives it to us over and over and over again. That God gives us what we don't deserve. And sometimes we look at God and we think to ourselves, if you're ever tempted to think, God, you're just not fair in life. Can I tell you something you should be thankful that God is not fair in life because if God was fair every single one of us would not have a chance in this world but because of his rich mercy this continual state of mercy in our life that the Bible tells us that he's abounding in rich mercy and so we have to understand this view this characteristic of God that God is a God that is full of mercy some of you are like, well, wasn't God like an angry God in the Old Testament, striking people dead? But now he's this loving pushover God in the New Testament, and he's just love, 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 love. Can I tell you this about God? He has always been just, and he's always been merciful. He's, he's always been righteous, and he's always been loving. And the problem that so many of us have and the problem that we have oftentimes even in our relationship with God is we just have a wrong view of who God is. And so many people's view of God starts in Genesis 3. And in Genesis 3, if you know the Bible, or if you've read it any times, what happens in Genesis 3 is this is the fall of man. This is, this is Adam and Eve in the garden and the apple, and she eats of the apple, and it's the fall of man. And so many people's view of God starts in Genesis 3, and then it ends in Revelations 20, because in Revelations 20, it's the book of the Bible that talks about the judgment of God, and, and that for those who don't give their hearts to Christ, those who have not accepted his grace and lived in his mercy, that they'll be condemned to eternal hell and eternal judgment from God. And so many people's theology starts with Genesis 3 and then it ends in Revelations 20. But that's not where the story of God starts. It's not where the story starts and it's not where the story ends. The Bible tells us that the story begins in Genesis 1. And in Genesis 1, what does the Bible tell us about the God that we serve? It says he created everything. And everything that he created was good. That he created the sun, the moon, and the stars. And he said, guess what? It's good. And then he created animals and dogs and cats. And he looked at the cats and said, eh, they're okay. No, no. He said, they're good too, you know. He created watermelon and cantaloupes and apples and he created the oceans and the mountains, the sun, the stars. He created everything. And then he says, it is all good. And then the Bible says he created man. And when he created man, he didn't just say it was good. He says, it is very, very good. And he gave us all of these things and he created people. 
And it all started with the goodness of God. That's where this book starts with. The mercy, the goodness, the faithfulness of our God. And he looked at human beings and he says, enjoy it all. Be naked. Multiply. Eat. Have fun. Do whatever you want because everything is good. And then he looked at him. He says, just don't eat of this one tree in the center of the garden. For if you eat of this tree, you surely will die, not a physical death, but a spiritual death. And the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve took of this fruit in the garden, and and it brought a separation between them and God. They disobeyed God. And what did God do in that moment? Was it because he was a mean, angry, judgmental God? Did he strike them dead right there in the garden? No. That's not what he did. He looked at Adam and Eve and he says, there's consequences to the decisions and the choices that you've made. And he looked at him and said, I've got bad news for you. You're going to have to labor really hard in life. And women, you are going to have to give birth to children. So stop being mad at your husbands in that moment, okay? And be mad at uh, Adam and Eve. What did God do? In his mercy that is new every morning. He didn't cast them down. He didn't strike them dead in a garden. But because his mercy is new every morning, the Bible says he sacrificed an innocent animal. And he took the skin of those animals and he covered them. Why? Because his mercy is new every morning. What we have to understand about the characteristic of Jehovah Hesed is that his mercy was there in the beginning in Genesis 1. It starts with the goodness of God. Everything he created is good. In Revelations 21 and verse in chapter 21 and 22, guess what? God makes all things new again. That we need to understand that our Bible starts with the mercy of God. It ends with the mercy of God. And the reason it starts and ends with the mercy of God is because his mercy is new every single morning. That this is who our God is. He is a merciful God. In the Old Testament, the Bible tells us that that David had sinned against God. Now, this isn't the sin of David that that he committed when he looked down on Bathsheba. Like, honestly, in the life of David, David was actually pretty good at sinning. This is a different sin that David committed in his life. And this was a sin that that his actions could have had severe consequences on countless people in Israel. But watch what David did. Watch what he says when when this sin is brought to light. It's found in 2 Samuel 24, verse 14. He says, let us fall into the hands of the Lord. He says, I want to fall into the hands of the Lord. For why? For his mercy is great. Because this is the character of the God that I serve. I want to fall into God's hands. But then he goes on and says, but do not let me fall into human hands. Do not let me fall into human hands. David's saying, God may have mercy on my life, but I know that so many people won't. And the truth is, is this is what we've often discovered in our life. And this is honestly the tragedy of so many of Christianity. That Christians who are supposed to be the most merciful because our God has been merciful to us are often those who show the least amount of mercy. And we're going to come back to that in a second. But I want you to show you just how much mercy means to God. Because I want us to understand this characteristic, this trait. In the Old Testament, God gives detailed instruction for the building of the holy temple. The holy temple was just simply the place that that God's presence dwelt. It was the place where God was at. And And so in the Old Testament, he comes to his people and says, I want you to build a home for me. I want you to build a place for the presence of God. And he begins to give David instructions. And he says, you know what? He gives him detailed instructions. He says, you're going to build a portico, and there's going to be an entryway, and and there's going to be a storeroom in this house. And and he gives them, there's an upper part and a lower part. And he begins to say, these are going to be the dimensions. This is going to be the size of it. Here's the materials I want you to use. I want this to be made out of gold, this to be made out of bronze, this to be made out of silver. And he gives David all the instructions for the temple of God. And then he looks at David and he says, in the middle of my house, I want you to build a place of of atonement. I want you to build, he says, a mercy seat. Why did God want there to be a mercy seat in the middle of his 
house. The reason he wanted there to be a mercy seat in the middle of his home, in the place that he would dwell, is because he wanted us to also understand that his characteristic is a characteristic of mercy, and that in the house of God, that we always need to make room for mercy. That mercy must always be present. That it's what's in the center of God's house. And can I tell you something? As believers and followers of Jesus Christ, it should be what's at the center of our heart and what's at the center of our lives. That mercy should be overflowing out of us because we serve a God who is full of mercy. That we need to make room for mercy in our life. That the Bible would even go on to tell us that mercy triumphs over judgment, that the mercy of God is greater than any judgment that we can face in our life, and we have to make room for mercy. And as Christians, can I talk to you just for a second, church? As followers of Jesus Christ, We should be the most merciful people on the face of the earth. And the reason we should be the most merciful people is because we've received the most mercy. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He gave up his life for us. And what I've seen in the body of Christ is we serve a merciful God. We serve a God who is full of mercy. But too often in the body of Christ, we want mercy for our life and we want justice for everyone else. And the biggest deterrent to people coming to Christ is narrow-minded, judgmental, hypocritical Christians without the mercy of God. The biggest deterrent are those of us who have received the most mercy not being willing to extend mercy. Because what is our message? Our message is the message of Christ. The message of Christ is come as you are. Come with all of your baggage. Come with all of your doubts. Come with all of your fears. Come with all of your hang-ups. Come with your brokenness. Come with your sinfulness. Come with your porn addiction. Come with your struggles. Come with your lying. Come with your envy. Come with your guilt. But simply come to Jesus that he is full of mercy. And this is the message of Christ. This is the message of the church that we've received mercy. And so now we must extend it into every place that we go. Amen. Give Jesus Christ an ovation of praise. And the church house should be the safest and securest and most comfortable place for people to walk in with all of their hang-ups because we've received mercy and we can point them to a God who is full of mercy. Can I tell you and remind you that you are not a perfect person? So why are we demanding perfection of all of those people that are around us? None of us are perfect. We've been forgiven. We are people of grace. And we need to start living out the mercy of God and pointing them to a merciful God and allowing God to straighten them out. I'm not telling you to get easy on sin. I'm just telling you to be full of mercy and full of love because guess what? That is the heart of the God that we serve. It is who he is. He is Jehovah Hesed. And so we have to make room for mercy. We have to make room for mercy. For some of you, you need to receive it. You need to receive the mercy of God in your life. You need to understand that you are forgiven, that you are changed, that you are brand new in Christ. 
So stop living like you haven't been forgiven. Stop living like you are still that old person. Walk into the mercy of God in your life. Receive it. That God gives you what you don't deserve. Like you deserve something else. I get it. But I'm going to walk in the mercy and the fullness of Christ. That he, in the fullness of his love that he has for me. For some of us, you need to make room for the mercy of God. You need to receive it. For some of us in this room, you need to learn to give it. You need to learn to give the mercy of God. You've become so judgmental. You've become so hard. You've become so this justice of God, justice of God, justice of God, that you've forgotten that Christ has poured out mercy in you. And so for some of you, you need to learn to give it. Because there's a difference between justice, grace, and mercy. Justice is when you get what you deserve, and we all deserve death. Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. And that's the free gift of salvation from Jesus Christ. But mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. I don't get it because of his mercy in my life. And I just wonder today, how many people are thankful for the mercy of God in their life? How many people are thankful that this God that we serve, that the, who he is, is simply a God of mercy. That I can thank God that I do not get what my sins deserve. That I'm broken and wretched and I deserve death, but I don't get what my sins deserve. That he's merciful. But not only is he merciful, guess what? He is just. And this is the hard part, that when someone sins, something must die. And because he's also just and he's also full of mercy, the justice side of God says something must die. So he sent his son to pay that price for me because a payment still had to be made. And may we never forget the payment that was made for each and every one of us. And the Bible tells us that because we've received mercy, there's only one reasonable response to the mercy of God. It's found in Romans 12 verse 1 that says this, in view of God's mercy, like, okay, I get it. You are a God of mercy. I'm a person who's received mercy. In view of God's mercy, we must offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true act of what? What? Worship back to Him. That that's my response to the mercy of God. That if I know that this is the God that I serve, if I know this is the characteristic of the God that I've given my life to, that He is a God of mercy, then my only response is here's my life, God. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to give it all to God you because that's the response that I can only have to a merciful God now for some of you today you might say Aaron I thank God for his mercy I'm grateful that I serve a merciful God but I, I'm still hurting I, I, I'm still broken like I look around at our world today and man it, it, it's hard we live in a broken world we live in a world filled with so much anxiety and tension like I have never seen before. And if that's where you find yourself at today, I want to take you back to what Jeremiah said in Lamentations 3, verses 22 and 23. He said, that's where I found myself in my life. But he says, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. So great is his faithfulness. His mercy is new every morning. 
That whatever you need from God, you need to understand that his arms are wide open because his mercy is new every morning. That God started with mercy and he ends with mercy. His mercy is new every morning. That his grace starts anew today. That his love starts anew today. That his compassion for you starts anew today. That his goodness starts anew today. That his kindness starts anew today. That Jeremiah Maya said when you're downcast, when you're hurting, when you're going through difficult moments of life, that you can call this to mind, that you can call that he is Jehovah Hesed to mind, that this is who my God is, that he is a God of mercy, that God is a Jehovah Hesed. He's always been good. He's always been faithful. He's always been the God that comforts me. He's always been a source of strength in my life. He's always been the healer. He's always always been the one to hear my prayers and to hear my cries that guess what his mercy never ceases he is rich in mercy and they are new every single morning so if you find yourself hurting the good news is this is that his mercy is new every single morning that his arms are open wide and he has whatever you need today because he is Jehovah Hesed he is a God of mercy would you give Jesus Christ an ovation of praise? Amen and amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning? That's who our God is. God is mercy. He is Jehovah Hesed. And so I simply ask you today, what do you need today? What, what do you need today? Because his mercy is new. His mercy is new. So you've walked in here and you're hurting and you're struggling and life is overwhelming and it's more than you can bear and there's so many situations that are going on and it's been a horrible weekend and, and there's been struggle after struggle after struggle. What do you need today? Because his mercy is new today for you. You need his presence. His presence is here. You need his love, his love is here. You need his direction, his direction is here. His mercy is new every morning. That is the God that we serve. So whatever you need, that's the God that we serve, the God that wants to meet you in the middle of your need. Because he's faithful. He's faithful. Like he's faithful to you. He's gonna be faithful in that situation. I know it seems overwhelming, but he's faithful. He's faithful, he's faithful, he's faithful. So whatever you need, his mercy is new. And when we understand who our God is, that he is Jehovah Hasid, I would ask you, what is your response to who God is? And the Bible tells us that our only reasonable response is here's my life, here's my worship to you, God. Here is all of me, because God, I recognize that you are a God full of mercy.